the shocking moments in midair. Passengers tackle a person who allegedly tried to open the emergency exit door of a plane mid-flight. Plus, they support freedom of navigation and free flow of commerce. This is an alert they're sending to other ships in the area, letting them know to look out for threats. Up close in the line of fire in the Red Sea, why we all need to be paying attention to what's happening in this critical shipping channel. And I've seen people all across the country reach to me and say, how could you do this so much hurt around? And I'm like, have you been in the field? Meet the black farmers trying to buck stereotypes around cotton farming. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including breaking news at the border, the move President Biden is now considering. Plus, one of Alabama's largest hospitals stopping IVF fertility treatments in the wake of that unprecedented decision by the state Supreme Court and a one point two billion dollars of student loan relief coming to 150,000 students how to determine if you qualify but we do begin tonight with the turmoil in the skies two flights diverted within 24 hours first a flight from Albuquerque to Chicago this video right here captured the moment passengers struggled to stop a man who was allegedly trying to open the emergency exit in midair dragging him away to help flight attendants secure him with duct tape the flight returned to Albuquerque where police were waiting while another flight from Newark to Los Angeles was diverted to Chicago after the crew discovered a possible bomb threat. Emergency crews were at the ready there. The incidents are just the latest in a rise in unruly passenger behavior. More than 200 cases have been reported so far this year. ABC's Gio Benitez leads us off tonight from Newark International. Tonight, two planes diverted in less than 24 hours, getting the attention of the FBI. Just this morning, emergency vehicles swarming the tarmac in Chicago after a possible bomb threat on this United plane, originally going from Newark to Los Angeles. When we landed, they told us um, that somebody had written a bomb threat on a mirror in a bathroom. United Airlines saying the flight was diverted due to a potential security concern. They didn't even announce anything to start. I, um, I got a notification on my watch uh, that said my flight was being diverted to Chicago. Finally, after like 15 minutes, the, the pilot came on on the radio or on the PA and said um, there was a situation and and that we had to, to descend. Passengers were taken off the plane and loaded onto buses. Chicago police saying they responded and cleared the scene. Somebody gets help. And just yesterday, an American Airlines flight from Albuquerque to Chicago forced to return after a passenger allegedly tried to open a door while in the air. Zach Etkendi and other passengers jumping in. We all managed to kind of rip him off the door, which he was trying to open, and get him into the aisle. And then once he was in the aisle, I sat on him while some other people held his legs, other people who were holding onto his arms. And eventually one of the flight attendants brought duct tape so we could duct tape his legs together. And then they had flexi cuffs, which we put around his arms. Police meeting the plane, taking the man into custody, leading him down the jetway stairs in handcuffs. And Gio joins us now from Newark Airport. Uh, Gio, on that United flight out of Newark with the possible bomb threat, did authorities find any threat to the public? So, Lindsay, right now the FBI says that there is no imminent threat to the public. At least there's no sign of that right now. Uh, those passengers, though, they were delayed by a few hours, but they should be landing in L.A. later tonight. Lindsay. All right. Gio Benitez for us. Thanks so much, Gio. Now to a follow up on that major Alabama Supreme Court ruling finding frozen embryos to be people. Tonight, a major hospital has announced it is pausing all IVF treatments. Here's ABC's Elizabeth Schulze. Tonight, one of Alabama's largest hospitals stopping IVF fertility treatments in the wake of that unprecedented decision by the state Supreme Court. Alabama, the first state in the country to consider frozen embryos people. And now the University of Alabama at Birmingham Health System saying, we must evaluate the potential that our patients and our physicians could be prosecuted criminally or face punitive damages for following the standard of care for IVF treatments. During IVF, multiple embryos are typically frozen to improve families' chances of a successful pregnancy. Now, it could be a crime to destroy them. Tonight on the campaign trail, candidate Nikki Haley agreeing with the state court. And embryos to me are babies. When you talk about an embryo, you are talking about, to me, um, that's a life. Haley did not say what this could mean for Alabama families who are relying on IVF to conceive, like Gabby Goydell and her husband. But I didn't think that anybody would want to stop us from having children. 
quite a slippery slope there. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze joins us now. Elizabeth, you've been talking with doctors about this ruling. What are they telling you? You know, Lindsay, doctors we've been talking to called this ruling incomplete, saying it doesn't address a lot of the issues surrounding IVF. There are still so many questions about what this means for families and for providers. Lindsay? A lot of questions there. Elizabeth Schulze for us. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. ABC News has just learned President Biden is considering major new action, significant restrictions on the southern border. ABC's Mary Bruce is at the White House now with the details. Mary, what can you tell us? Well, Lindsay, I'm told that the White House is considering possibly taking executive action to impose tough new restrictions on asylum. One possibility would be to bar migrants from seeking asylum if they cross between U.S. ports of entry. Now, I'm told the president is looking at a wide range of options. This is just one possibility that's under consideration and that no final decisions have yet been made. But this does, of course, come after Republicans on the Hill under pressure from Donald Trump tanked that bipartisan border deal. And as President Biden is eager to show voters that he takes this issue seriously. Lindsay? Mary Bruce from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. We are getting a first look at the former FBI informant who authorities say admitting to having ties with Russian intelligence. He's now charged with lying about President Biden's son, the president, and Ukraine. Meanwhile, Republicans question the president's brother behind closed doors. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has more. Tonight, a first glimpse of the longtime FBI informant accused of working with Russian intelligence officials to spread lies about President Biden. Alexander Smirnov doing his best to conceal his identity as he spirited away from a courthouse in Las Vegas. Prosecutors say Smirnov was actively peddling new lies that could impact U.S. elections after meeting with Russian intelligence officials in November. Smirnov is charged with lying to the FBI, making up a story that as vice president, Joe Biden accepted a $5 million bribe from Burisma, the Ukrainian energy company where his son Hunter sat on the board. That false story cited by House Republicans again and again to justify launching their impeachment investigation. A highly credible FBI source alleges that Joe Biden received $5 million in exchange for pressuring for the firing of a Ukrainian prosecutor. According to this highly credible well-respected human source, yeah. then uh, there was a bribe made. But prosecutors say it was all a fabrication. Today, Congressman Jim Jordan, a leader of the impeachment investigation, deflecting, insisting he had been once told by a Justice Department official that Spirinoff was credible. That this, this confidential human source had all the indicia of credibility because he checked out the times and places that he said he was and found that he was actually in those locations. But so, they're now calling so him a liar, the well, special counsel. All I'm saying is you got to ask the FBI about that. He, he, he may in fact have given false statement. I don't know. Democrats say the Smirnoff indictment makes impeachment case closed. Well, I think the Smirnoff revelations destroy the entire case. It was that foundation that the whole House of Cards has been built on and the entire thing has collapsed. But Republicans who have uncovered no evidence President Biden committed impeachable offenses pressing anyway. Your brother involved in any for business dealings? Today calling the president's brother James Biden to testify. No comment outside, but behind closed doors, James Biden telling lawmakers his brother has never had any involvement or any direct or indirect financial interest in his business dealings. Biden adding, I never asked my brother to take any official action on behalf of me, my business associates, or anyone else. ABC's Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, a lot of competing news there. Which is getting the most attention from lawmakers? Well, Lindsay, the president's brother, James Biden, testified behind closed doors for roughly eight hours. But the news of the FBI informant and his alleged lies today overshadowed that testimony. Republicans were defiant. Congressman Jim Jordan telling me today the Spirinoff case doesn't change a thing, Lindsay. Pierre Thomas for us. Thanks so much, Pierre. Overseas tonight, Ukraine's military is warning that Russia is about to launch a major offensive with U.S. aid to Ukraine blocked by Republicans in the House. We'll talk with the Pentagon's deputy spokeswoman about how the lack of U.S. support is impacting Ukraine's chances on the battlefield in a moment. But first, to ABC's James Longman in Ukraine. Tonight, Ukrainian commanders with a stark warning. Russia is on the brink of a major offensive on multiple fronts across the east. Bombing Kramatorsk overnight following their takeover of the town of Adivka, regaining ground lost in Ukraine's counteroffensive last summer. Russian President Vladimir Putin with his top general surveying the territory won back, congratulating the troops and urging them on. 
Almost two years into this war, Ukraine says it's outmanned and outgunned. Digging trenches as the Russians close in, military aid on hold, blocked by Republicans in the U.S. House. And with new U.S. sanctions looming after the death of Putin's fiercest critic Alexei Navalny, Russian authorities have now detained a dual U.S.-Russian citizen. They released this video, reportedly showing 33-year-old ballerina Kasnia Karolina, who lives and works in Los Angeles, with a hat covering her eyes and handcuffed, ready to appear in court. She's been charged with treason. Russian authorities claim she donated about $50 to a Ukrainian charity in the United States. Karolina was part of the Baltimore Ballet in 2017. Her former mother-in-law says she was arrested while visiting family in Russia. If we don't help her, we can say goodbye to her. If we do not protect her as an American citizen, nobody else will. James Longman joins us now from Kiev. And, and James, what advice does the U.S. have for Americans and others considering travel to Russia tonight? Well, U.S. officials have repeatedly said throughout this conflict that uh, Americans should not be traveling to Russia, but it feels like they're sharpening that now. John Kirby at the National Security Council says that if you're a U.S. citizen in Russia, even if you're a dual U.S.-Russian national, you might be living, but even just traveling in Russia, it doesn't matter. Get out now. That's what they say. Lindsay? All right. James Longman for us in Kiev once again tonight. Thanks so much, James. We are joined now by Deputy Pentagon Press Secretary Sabrina Singh. Thank you so much for joining us. As we just heard there in James's report, Ukraine is facing growing challenges to hold off the larger and better supplied Russian army. What's the administration's biggest concern here? Well, our biggest concern is that we don't get the supplemental funding that we've requested from Congress. Uh, we haven't been able to send military aid assistance to Ukraine since December 27th. And they're in the fight of their lives. I mean, they're continuing to push in the east and in the south, but they need their air defenses, artillery, more ammunition from United States stocks that we were sending almost on a weekly basis to them. And we are very grateful for the contributions that our allies and partners have made all across the world to Ukraine, but they still need U.S. assistance in their fight, and it's critical that they get it at this moment right now. And, and we see lately that Ukraine has really been struggling on the battlefields. Can you draw a straight line to us and our lack of support in this moment? Absolutely. It's because of, of congressional inaction that you've had to see, unfortunately, Ukraine make the calculation for a strategic withdrawal from Avdivka. Um, because we were not able to get them more ammunition, more artillery, uh, the air defenses that they need, they did have to make that strategic decision to pull back in order to conserve more resources for other fights and to hold other lines, uh, whether it be in the east or in the south. And so, um, absolutely, it's because of congressional inaction that you're seeing some of the consequences play out on the battlefield, which is why we've been very public and in our private conversations with lawmakers that we really urge uh, the House to pass the bipartisan Senate supplemental package that was passed last week um, so we can continue to flow military aid to Ukraine. Some of those against further funding for Ukraine have argued that that money is actually needed here in the U.S. If Congress approves the more than $60 billion the administration is requesting for Ukraine, how would you justify that? Well, they're absolutely right. It is money that actually is coming back to the U.S. It is money that will invigorate our defense industrial base. It is money that will go across states, across this country, that will put people to work making and manufacturing the artillery, the ammunition, the, the exact air defenses that we're talking about Ukraine needs. We're talking about U.S. jobs being created by this supplemental package. And so when people are talking about, when congressmen are talking about, um, is this going to benefit the American people? It absolutely is. You're going to see the economy uh, grow because of what's happening in the defense industrial base. And that, because of the products that are produced from the defense industrial base, that is going to have a direct impact on what's happening on the battlefield in Ukraine. And let's turn now to the security situation in the Red Sea. Houthi rebels, as you know, yeah. continue to fire on commercial targets despite U.S. and allied strikes. What's it going to take to resolve the situation there? Well, it's really a decision that the Houthis have to make. It's their calculation on when they're going to stop these attacks. They're attacking innocent mariners. They're attacking U.S. Uh, ships, uh, our, our vessels in the Red Sea. They just hit a commercial vessel that was carrying grain that was destined for Yemen, for their own citizens, for a starving population. All we can do is continue to urge them to stop these attacks. And if they don't, 
we will continue to hold them responsible, either with our coalition, our joint strikes, or when you see us do dynamic strikes in a unilateral fashion. And lastly, just uh, to drastically switch gears here, I want to ask you about Secretary Austin. How's he doing right. and his recovery going? Yeah, no, it's a, thanks for the question. I, the secretary has been recovering well. He's back in the building. I was just on a call with him today. It was great to see him uh, through our video screens, uh, but he's doing well. Um, he's happy to be back in the building. There's a lot on his plate that he's thinking about. Not only, as you mentioned, the attacks that the Houthis continue to launch in the Red Sea, we're focused on getting the supplemental across, making sure that Ukraine has what it needs. And of course, we have never lost sight of our pacing challenge of the PRC in the Indo-Pacific. And so he's juggling a lot right now, but it's really good to have him back in the office. I can imagine. Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh, we thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much. Now to the race for the White House. Sir Eva Pilgrim asks Nikki Haley about Donald Trump's comments regarding her husband's deployment overseas. Haley firing back. Rachel Scott with the report. Tonight, just three days before the South Carolina primary, former Governor Nikki Haley firing back at Donald Trump for mocking her husband Michael, who is serving a one-year deployment overseas as a major in the South Carolina Army National Guard. Where's her husband? Oh, he's away. He's away. Where, what happened to her husband? What happened to her husband? On the trail, Haley growing emotional, talking about her husband's deployment. I wish our children and I could see him tonight, but we can't. Haley today addressing Trump's comments in an interview with ABC's Eva Pilgrim and defending military families like her own. I'm in that year-long prayer wanting him to come home safely, but so many military families go through this. He just doesn't get it that this is about something bigger than ourselves. We saw you sort of fight back against him when he mentioned your husband and his deployment. That really ticked you off. <laughs> I mean, look, I, it's, it's not personal for me and Michael. We can handle that. It's personal when you think of military families. They go through a lot. Don't make light of that. To me, veterans are off limits. Don't talk about them. Don't say anything because every freedom Donald Trump has is because of the men and women in our military. He's never known what it means to sacrifice for something other than yourself. Haley with this message to South Carolina Republicans who would vote for Trump. Don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't get this right in a primary because we will lose. It's that simple, we will lose. Everything he touches, we lose. And so at some point you have to say maybe he's the problem. Harsh words there from Nikki Haley. Rachel Scott joins us now. Hey, Rachel, Governor Haley still polling well behind Trump, even in her home state of South Carolina, but she is vowing to stay in the race. Yeah, she just told the crowd here that she is not going anywhere. She said she is actually going somewhere, and that's to Michigan the day after the South Carolina primary. Win or lose, she's staying in this race. But, Lindsay, to be clear, she is still trailing Donald Trump by more than 30 points here in South Carolina and 60 points nationally, Lindsay. And already making her plans for Super Tuesday. Rachel Scott for us in Buford, South Carolina. Thanks so much, Rachel. A prosecutor in Arizona is refusing to extradite a murder suspect to New York City, claiming New York prosecutors are too lenient. That suspect is alleged to have committed several crimes across the country. Trevor Ault has this report. Tonight, the Manhattan District Attorney accusing an Arizona prosecutor of playing political games in a murder investigation by refusing to extradite a murder suspect in a New York case from Arizona back to New York to face charges. Having observed... Uh, the treatment of violent criminals in the New York area by the Manhattan DA there, Alvin Bragg. I think it's safer to keep him here. Maricopa attorney Rachel Mitchell calling out Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg for being soft on crime, refusing to extradite Rod Almansori to New York City. Almansori is wanted in the killing of 38-year-old Denise Oleas Arancibia, who was found bludgeoned to death in this New York City hotel on February 8th. The NYPD releasing these surveillance images, appearing to show Alman Sori wearing the victim's leggings after the alleged murder. Authorities say just days ago, he stabbed multiple women in Arizona and has several prior arrests in Florida and Texas. They believe he may have been involved in other unsolved attacks. Anywhere that he's visited, there's potential that there are other victims around the country. 
The Maricopa attorney said she was concerned if Al Mansouri was extradited back to New York, there was a chance he could be released on bail. The Manhattan DA called her comments a gross insult. Lindsay. Trevor, thank you. A young girl has died after getting buried in sand at a Florida beach near Fort Lauderdale. Seven-year-old Sloan Mattingly and her nine-year-old brother Maddox were on vacation with their parents from Indiana when a deep hole of sand that they were playing in collapsed around them. Both children were taken to a local hospital, but seven-year-old Sloan tragically died. The Broward County Sheriff's Office says they are investigating the incident. And back to that crisis in the Red Sea, that critical shipping channel, Revenues are down 40 to 50 percent of the Suez Canal since the Houthi attacks began. Our Brit Clinic got rare access onto a U.S. warship there to see the front lines of the push to dial back tensions and prevent the Israel-Hamas war from becoming a wider regional conflict. This is the front line of the fight against Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. On board the USS Eisenhower, given inside access to one of the American warships launching near daily preemptive strikes on Houthi targets to stop them from firing on commercial vessels in this critical shipping lane that provides passage for around 12% of global trade every year. Another super hoarder taking on for a mission across the Red Sea. Despite this show of force, the Houthis seemingly defiant. Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Multiple recent attacks, including this. The Houthis saying this is the moment militants shoot down an American drone over the Yemeni port city of Hodeida. Allah Akbar! The wreckage of the MQ-9 drone seen here on a beach in the early hours of Monday morning. And a strike on a Belize-flagged bolt carrier, one of the most damaging yet, forcing the crew to abandon ship. Altogether, the Houthis have attacked more than 50 ships since mid-November, keeping this ship, part of Carrier Strike Group 2, on a constant state of readiness. It's definitely a high operations tempo, like we're on call 24-7. Even just this morning at 3 a.m., I got a phone call that we might need to launch an aircraft. So uh, the around-the-clock nature has been hard. Commanding officer Melanie Ale operates the E-2C Hawkeye, answering distress calls from merchant ships. Is it more tense than you're used to? Definitely. Uh, I know a lot of times when we stand alert aircraft up, it's for training, and now it's real world. On alert, day and night. Now we're heading up to the deck to watch the nighttime flight operations. You'll notice that below deck, it's a lot more dim. There's a red light. That's partly because they're worried about light traveling so far. So this way, they can be less detectable. And guided missile destroyers playing a critical role in this operation. We're currently on our way from the USS Eisenhower to a destroyer, the USS Brazen. A warship at the sharp edge of US engagement with the Houthis. How quickly do you have to respond here? It can vary based on the threat, of course, so it can vary from seconds to minutes. Every weapon system they have here on the destroyer, this is where they're deployed from. This is where they're fighting the Houthis. Back up top on the bridge, the ship's eyes and ears. They support a freedom of navigation and free flow of commerce. This is an alert they're sending to other ships in the area, letting them know to look out for threats. Rear Admiral Mark Meguez says they are successfully degrading the Houthis' ability to attack, despite a flow of weapons from Tehran. I don't see them uh, being able to sustain the way that we can sustain uh, over the long term. Critics in the region say that U.S. presence here and, and these strikes are actually upping the temperature here and upping the tensions. What do you say to that? I say we are not here to escalate and we are not here to have any kind of offensive posture. The Houthis say these attacks are a show of solidarity with Palestinians and say they won't stop until Israel ends its bombardment of Gaza. They are a very capable group in that they are continuing to try and re, uh, reinstitute their tactics or reevaluate uh, uh, re their tactics, but our ability to degrade them is, is really unmatched. Naval officers on board the USS Eisenhower tell me they've been out here months without a break, unable to say how long they'll need to stay, with no clear end in sight to this dangerous game of cat and mouse in the Red Sea.
Our thanks to Brit for that. And here now to answer questions on how Houthi and Iranian threats to ships transiting the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden have affected global security and commerce is Ian Ralby. He's the founder and CEO of IR Concilium and an expert on maritime issues. Ian, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, let's start with how these attacks have, have really changed how container ship owners move goods and, and how has that affected prices here in the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. We've seen a really dramatic change in containerized cargo movements over the last few months. Since the 19th of November, we've seen an escalation by the Houthis that has led to mostly the container ships choosing to reroute around the continent of Africa. And that has made uh, a delay in a lot of our goods, but it hasn't um, been as dramatic an impact as, as some feared initially. Uh, the problem is that the Houthis are continuing to escalate, and so the full uh, economic impact and, and overall impact of the situation may yet be felt. And it's not just finished goods that we're talking about here. Plenty of raw products coming from India and Asia must now take that more circuitous route. What goods have been most affected? Well, really, the, the containerized goods have been the most affected, um, but we're now at a place where, because most of the containerized goods have moved, what's going through the Red Sea still are bulk goods like dry, dry materials, grains, uh, food supplies, and oil and gas and, and chemical supplies through tankers. We could see every type of, of cargo that moves by sea affected, and if we think about it more carefully, that is literally 90% of our world trade that is affected. So uh, it's, it's a huge globalized impact uh, for all of us. It, commerce aside, if we can really even put that to the side for a moment, but, but the Houthis in Iran could cause an environmental catastrophe if they strike an oil tanker. How much do African and Gulf countries depend on, on that water staying clean? It is a great question and a critical issue. The Red Sea is different than most other bodies of water because along the coast are desalination plants that provide the drinking water for tens of millions of people along both the, the uh, Arabian Peninsula coast and uh, the African uh, Red Sea coast. And that means that there are tens of millions of people who will only have a three-day lead supply on drinking water if an oil spill starts to uh, make those, those uh, desalination plants come offline. The humanitarian crisis that would come from that, that issue is almost uncalculable. The Houthis have attacked shipping now for three months. They say it's in defense of Gaza. But what is it really that they hope to accomplish here? The Houthis aren't really interested in Gaza. They, they haven't been, that has never been their main motivation. They're interested in Israel insofar as that is part of their overall strategy. The Houthis have been a movement for decades that have been militarized for most of the last two decades and at war with the government of Yemen for the last decade, all focused on first taking over all of Yemen, second heading towards Mecca, and third heading towards Jerusalem, where they ultimately hope to have a seat for their, their globalized holy empire. They do not care about Israel and Gaza. If, if it ended today, they would continue to attack shipping because they are loving the attention they are getting. They're loving the support that has come with it, both from Iran, uh, their main backer, as well as others. Uh, they have recruited heavily off of these, these uh, new attacks in this situation overall, and we've seen their numbers swell. So they are very energized by all of this, and they're really loving the attention. Well, the U.S. and allies have been guarding ships now for months, on occasion struck Houthi weapon stockpiles and guidance systems. Where do you see this conflict headed? Well, it's escalated sort of month on month. We saw the initial attack on the Galaxy Leader be a, a, a sort of a boarding and a, a capture of that ship, which they then turned into a, a tourist attraction. They then moved to their second phase, which was the, the aerial bombardment, both through drones and missiles of ships. But really, at this point, uh, the Houthis are having fewer and fewer targets to play with outside of the U.S. Navy and other navies. Now, the EU has launched its naval mission, which is arriving now, um, and that may help change the picture a little bit because as an economic force rather than a pure military force or military alliance, they may uh, take a slightly different approach. But uh, the time may have come at this point for us to, to maybe look at, at whether the U.S. Navy is better to be focusing elsewhere um, and, uh, and allow the EU to, to carry some of the water for us on this situation as the Houthis continue uh, to, to look for ways to, to gain attention. Uh, and if we take away some of that attention, they may, they may look for it elsewhere. What a wealth of knowledge, Ian Ralby. We thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you.
More than two years after Alec, actor Alec Baldwin fatally shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the New Mexico set of their movie Rust, the film's weapons handler is set to go to trial. Armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was charged with two counts of involuntary manslaughter and an additional charge of tampering with evidence in connection to Hutchins' death and injury to director Joel Souza. Gutierrez-Reed has pleaded not guilty to all charges. Jury selection began today after a judge denied the defense's latest effort to dismiss those charges. Tonight, heavy fog is being blamed for a massive pileup in Jones County, Mississippi. Roughly 20 cars and trucks slamming into each other on Highway 84. Ten people had to be rushed to the hospital. Meantime, heavy rain and snow is expected from Illinois to upstate New York tomorrow. And still much more ahead here on Prime tonight. Range Rovers, a BMW, and a Porsche, the brazen heist of hundreds of thousands in luxury cars. But next, many in the black community connect cotton to a crop that is part of the culture. Well, we have to remember, cotton wasn't the oppressive thing. Cotton is just a plant, and it's a magical plant at that. It was people that was oppressive. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Cotton has long had a negative connotation in the black community. It brings up thoughts of centuries of enslavement in which their ancestors were forced to toil the vast fields. Now, some black farmers are trying to remove that stigma, encouraging the community to focus on what it now is and what it could be instead of what it once represented. ABC senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami traveled to North Carolina to visit a man who's trying to pick out cotton's negative connotation. There's an unmistakable beauty to the snow-white cotton fields that blanket parts of the South in the fall. It's nature's notice, really, that shorter days are coming and that farmers will need to work longer nights harvesting what's arguably the most popular material in the world. A family speaking out after students were asked to clean cotton in class. But for many Americans, there's little poetry in cotton. My children are under no circumstance. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Need to be taught what it's like to be a slave or what it's like to be black. And for many black Americans in particular, there's a racism to the idea of picking it. She had a box of cotton on her desk and went around with the box and gave everyone about a handful. For example, parents were more than offended in Spokane, Washington, when a fifth grade teacher passed around a box of cotton during a history lesson. 
and told her students to pick it clean. And calling someone a cotton picker can seem very much a slur. That made me feel like I didn't like know that they actually thought of me that way. You know, it's work, but not the hardest work you can do. 37-year-old Julius Tillery is trying to take the bad word out of what it means for black people to pick cotton in America. There's not many of us. We're basically extinct. Extinct. There's less than 100 black cotton farmers in the whole country. He'll tell you that he's a cotton picker who owns hundreds of acres in North Carolina, has an economics degree, and is teaching black farmers across the South how to survive in a global economy. If I don't create a new history for us, it will always be a bad history. So I, I think it's really important that the work I do to help foster a better ideal around cotton is important. He's created a side business he calls Black Cotton, where he sells jewelry, home accessories, and has partnered with the people who make Vans shoes to create streetwear. Two years ago, Vans bought 10,000 pounds of his cotton. This year, they tell us they're buying twice as much. The shirts they sell come with a logo that Julius Tillery calls the new rose. Black cotton is the new rose. The new rose. We got to remember, this is American cotton. This is black cotton. This is special cotton. Our catchphrase is cotton is our culture. Let's grow together. We want to bring people into this and have, have everyone have a feeling around it that's positive. You're trying to change the brand of cotton within black culture. Absolutely. Like on the internet, people call me the Puff Daddy of Cotton, and I think that's cool. He's trying to improve on the history of cotton that in America is very much tied to that old idea that black people should be owned. In the movies, like 12 Years a Slave, just the picture of black Americans working on those endless cotton farms feels as ugly as can be. I'm a fifth generation cotton farmer, and we emphasize that because that means five generations of free men decided to do this work. And you know, us that live close to cotton fields, we know that cotton is not here to hurt us. But I've seen people all across the country reach to me and say, how could you do this? So much hurt around it. I'm like, have you been in the field? Like I had a, a rapper from uh, Atlanta come, and he um, shot a video at my farm. I came from the mud. This is Tillery, seen here in that video, in a song by artist King David Wilson. After the video, we say a prayer together, and he began to cry. And I hugged him, I said, what's wrong, brother? And he said, this is the freest I've ever felt as a black man. What is it? How do you explain to people that people need to flip that script? Well, we have to remember, cotton wasn't the oppressive thing. Cotton is just a plant, and it's a magical plant at that. It was people that was oppressive and made us work like we was machines. However, this is a new day. No one's making me do this work. No one's pressing me to do any of this work. So I had to decide to change my perspective on this. It's actually something to be proud of. In today's world, it's all about marketing the product that you, that you raise. Mm -hmm. He's taking over the business from his father and buried on their farm is the former slave in the family who was forced to work in these fields before buying the land as a free man more than 100 years ago. That's here, and it made me always feel like I had to protect this area. Julius Tillery says today, people need to see the pride in what he does, and not just the pain. Everything's intentional. We're here because of cotton in many ways. We just gotta not take it for granted. It's just, it's so important, and it comes from this little plant. So let's make the best of it. Let's change the bad narrative and let's bring people together over it. A lot of division over a single plant. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami for that. So much more to get to coming up. A new controversy brewing over abortion. The database a group of lawmakers wants to create. But next, there's a sharp rise in children living below the poverty line. We take a look at the growing trend by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Reporting from Taipei, Taiwan, I'm Britt Clement. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. A new report reveals a sharp rise in the number of children living below the poverty line in New York City nationwide. Children under 18 are by far the largest age group living in poverty. We have a look at this troubling trend by the numbers. 25% of children in New York City were living in poverty in 2022, according to the study by a research group at Columbia University. That's up from 15% just the year before and the city's highest rate of child poverty since 2015. Nationwide child poverty doubled in 2022, according to the U.S. Census, which calculates poverty slightly differently than the New York researchers. Analysts say the end of the expanded child tax credit of up to $300 per month is a key reason for that large increase. If that policy had been kept in place, about 3 million children, about half of the total increase would have been kept out of poverty. That's according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Other factors analysts say are adding to child poverty around the country are record inflation, rising child care costs, and the end of other forms of pandemic era relief. And we saw much more ahead here on Prime. Welcome relief for thousands with student loans. Who's getting their student loans canceled? And she was diagnosed with HIV as a toddler and fought for advocacy, appearing on national television. How people are remembering Hydea Broadband's legacy of service. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember 
that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program. Only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. A legal battle is brewing between Taylor Swift and a college student who publicly tracked her jet. The star's legal team says it puts her at risk from stalkers, but the attorney for the student says it's not illegal and falls under his right to free speech. ABC's Janae Norman has the details. A legal battle brewing between superstar Taylor Swift and 21-year-old college student Jack Sweeney sharing tracking information for Swift's private jet on social media. An attorney for Swift sending Sweeney a cease and desist letter in December, which he then posted on X. Now, the college student firing back, posting a letter from his attorney with the caption, Look what you made me do. Look what you made me do. In the letter, Sweeney's attorney claiming his client didn't do anything unlawful. We wanted to really hit home that there is no legal claim here, that this is just public information and that he's not using it in a nefarious way. And this is him tracking jets. Uh, and there's a purpose. Uh, these jets are emitting uh, an insane amount of carbon emissions. Swift's attorney, however, alleging Sweeney engaged in stalking and harassing behavior, writing, you essentially provide individuals intent on physically harming her or with nefarious or violent intentions, a roadmap to carry out their plans. I don't think it's great behavior. 
I don't applaud this. And I, I do worry it puts Swift in danger, but I don't see there being a, a legal remedy. Swift has repeatedly dealt with stalkers, including a man who was arrested multiple times outside her New York home in January. And this isn't the first time Sweeney has gotten into hot water for tracking flights. In 2022, his then Twitter account, Elon Jet, was suspended for keeping tabs on Tesla CEO and ex-owner Elon Musk's plane in real time. A spokesperson for Taylor Swift told ABC News earlier this month that we cannot comment on any ongoing police investigation, but can confirm the timing of stalkers suggests a connection. His posts tell you exactly when and where she would be. Our thanks to Janae Norman for that. And we have an update tonight on Isabella Strahan, our own Michael Strahan's daughter, who is currently battling a form of brain cancer. Isabella has been bravely documenting her journey on YouTube in the hopes of helping other people with the same diagnosis feel supported and to know they're not alone. Isabella started chemo this month. Here's how she's been doing. Woke up, came to the hospital. I think I'm just freaking myself out. This is a big bag of chemo, a big bag of drugs. And that's running for six hours now. Um, but I'm stressing myself out because I feel like everything could just go wrong with me at any moment. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just so terrified that my leg is gonna like start twitching. I don't know, or like, what if my organs just shut down? You only have two people in the hospital, so it's Kayla and Sophia right now. Mom and Cindy were here. Good morning. Dad's waiting to come in. Pulling up to the hospital with Isabella's favorite breakfast. And part of the protocol, you have to wash your hands first. So, when I wash your hands, when I wear a mask, everything is hands free. The sign here says count to 10. You wave your hand here, and this door opens, and then you're able to enter the area. Here's your room. Potatoes for breakfast? Yes. <laughs> Kayla last night. Potatoes for breakfast. Yummy. Well, your dad brought Chick fil A. Double breakfast. Yeah, just, just, just in case. So, my specialty <laughs> is I need to a loaded baked potato. <laughs> with lots of cheese, lots of sour cream. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. So, today I have my um, room tour. So, pan around. Two TVs. No Netflix. <laughs> the sound from the big TV only comes out of this, which is so unfortunate. And they have different um, channels on each one. You just gotta decide which one you wanna watch. And then what else? I have my stress ball, my water bottle, some AirPods, my chapstick. What's what's this thing? Straws. Oh, this is my friend that has been attached to me for three years. This is my um, I don't know what it's called. Hazardous ball. <laughs> but it's where I like all my drugs are hung. Oh. I have all my fancy wires. All going into here. Okay, so my eyes are strained. They hurt um, to look to the sides. My whole mouth feels like I got a one giant root canal of my whole mouth of every single tooth and just ripped out and not even surgically put back in. <laughs> my jaw hurts. My tongue, the bottom of my tongue hurts. Does it feel better being home versus the hospital? Oh, yeah, it's my first time home in a month. I slept in my bed for the first time in a while. Um, personally, I don't mind the hospital too much because I feel safe. <laughs> yeah. But um, I do like being home. I'm going to take a walk today. Maybe stretch. Stretch. Drink more water. And eat. And eat something. Potatoes are my favorite food. And that's the only thing I've eaten in the past two days. A baked potato. Two baked potatoes. <laughs> that's like two baked potatoes and tater tots. Those are, that's with lots of sour cream, ketchup, Chick-fil-A sauce. Butter. 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 Bacon. Bacon. Cheese. Some onions. On cheese. <laughs> lots of cheese. <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite meal to eat. I could eat that every day. We continue to send up prayers and well wishes for Isabella.
The Biden administration cancels more than a billion dollars in student loan debt, a dangerous luxury cars heist, and Boeing makes a change after that door plug blew out during an Alaska Airlines flight. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. The Biden administration canceling even more student loan debt for some borrowers. The White House announcing that about 153,000 Americans will receive some form of debt relief, totaling about $1.2 billion. So far, the Biden administration has approved debt relief for nearly 4 million Americans. The Department of Education will automatically cancel or relieve some of that debt and will notify borrowers beginning next week. A 17-year-old from Chicago was charged in a brazen heist of nearly $600,000 worth of luxury automobiles. The suspect was allegedly part of a group of people who broke into a car dealership and drove away in the stolen vehicles. Prosecutors say they are still looking for eight others who were allegedly involved in the scheme. Range Rovers, a BMW, a Jaguar, and a Porsche were among the cars stolen from the showroom. Investigators said one of the cars belonged to a customer. The suspect was charged with burglary and several felonies. An Oklahoma teenager who identified as non-binary died after a school fight with older students in an Oklahoma high school. The teenager, Nex Benedict, was 16 years old. Investigators are still looking into the incident, but school officials say the students were in the bathroom for two minutes before other students and a staff member broke up the fight. Police say Benedict was taken to the hospital after the fight and died the next day. Oklahoma State House is considering a law that would create a database of people who have had an abortion. The bill passed out of committee, the full Oklahoma State House expected to vote next month. Oklahoma currently outlaws all abortion except to save the life of the mother. The new bill would order that state's public health department to record and track how many abortions a patient's had. Police could also access that information with a court order. Boeing is replacing the executive who ran its 737 MAX program months after an Alaska Airlines door plug blew out in flight, leaving a hole in the cabin before pilots safely landed the jet. At the time, Boeing's CEO took full responsibility. The FAA grounded some 737 MAX planes after that incident. Alaska Airlines resumed flying their 737s after the FAA released instructions on how to inspect the aircraft for malfunctions. AIDS activist Hydea Broadbent has died. She began her advocacy at the age of six, appearing on national television. Broadbent was orphaned as an infant and was adopted shortly after. When she was three, doctors diagnosed her as HIV positive. Her story resonated with millions living with HIV and AIDS. And for the last decade, she worked with the Magic Johnson Foundation raising AIDS awareness. Hydea Broadbent was 39 years old. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the growing desperation in Gaza as the food crisis there mounts amid fears of a future famine. And hundreds of protesters line the streets of London. A high-profile prisoner, they say, should be free. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. The Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane, celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel, from the front lines in downtown Ramallah, in Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News live weeknights wherever you stream your news. California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including a major new move President Biden is considering at the border, plus a horrific scene on a Florida beach. A seven-year-old buried while digging a hole in the sand with her brother and the dire situation in Gaza as the World Food Program is forced to suspend deliveries. But we do begin with the turmoil in the skies. Two flights diverted within 24 hours. First, on a flight from Albuquerque to Chicago, this video right here captures the moment passengers struggled to stop a man who was allegedly trying to open the emergency exit in midair, dragging him away to help flight attendants secure him. Then with duct tape, the flight returned to Albuquerque where police were waiting. Meantime, another flight from Newark to Los Angeles was diverted to Chicago after the crew discovered a possible bomb threat. Emergency crews were at the ready there. The incidents are the latest in a rise in unruly passenger behavior. More than 200 cases have been reported just this year. ABC's Gio Benitez has the latest. Tonight, two planes diverted in less than 24 hours, getting the attention of the FBI. Just this morning, emergency vehicles swarming the tarmac in Chicago after a possible bomb threat on this United plane originally going from Newark to Los Angeles. When we landed, they told us um, that somebody had written a bomb threat on a mirror in a bathroom. United Airlines saying the flight was diverted due to a potential security concern. They didn't even announce anything to start. I, um, I got a notification on my watch uh, that said my flight was being diverted to Chicago. Finally, after like 15 minutes, the, the pilot came on, on the radio or on the PA and said, um, there was a situation and and that we had to, to descend. Passengers were taken off the plane and loaded onto buses. Chicago police saying they responded and cleared the scene. Somebody gets help. And just yesterday, an American Airlines flight from Albuquerque to Chicago forced to return after a passenger allegedly tried to open a door while in the air. Zach Etkendi and other passengers jumping in. We all managed to kind of rip him off the door, which he was trying to open, and get him into the aisle. And then once he was in the aisle, I sat on him while some other people held his legs, other people who were holding onto his arms. And eventually one of the flight attendants brought duct tape so we could duct tape his legs together. And then they had flexi cuffs, which we put around his arms. Police meeting the plane, taking the man into custody, leading him down the jetway stairs in handcuffs. Some really scary incidents there. Thanks to Gio for that. Now to a follow-up on the major Alabama Supreme Court ruling finding frozen embryos to be people. Tonight, a major hospital has announced it is pausing all IVF treatments. Here's ABC's Elizabeth Schulze. 
Tonight, one of Alabama's largest hospitals stopping IVF fertility treatments in the wake of that unprecedented decision by the state's Supreme Court. Alabama, the first state in the country to consider frozen embryos people. And now the University of Alabama at Birmingham Health System saying, we must evaluate the potential that our patients and our physicians could be prosecuted criminally or face punitive damages for following the standard of care for IVF treatments. During IVF, multiple embryos are typically frozen to improve families' chances of a successful pregnancy. Now, it could be a crime to destroy them. Tonight on the campaign trail, candidate Nikki Haley agreeing with the state court. And embryos to me are babies. When you talk about an embryo, you are talking about, to me, um, that's a life. Haley did not say what this could mean for Alabama families who are relying on IVF to conceive, like Gabby Goydell and her husband. But I didn't think that anybody would want to stop us from having children. Quite a slippery slope there. ABC's Elizabeth Schulz joins us now. Elizabeth, you've been talking with doctors about this ruling. What are they telling you? You know, Lindsay, doctors we've been talking to called this ruling incomplete, saying it doesn't address a lot of the issues surrounding IVF. There are still so many questions about what this means for families and for providers. Lindsay? A lot of questions there. Elizabeth Schulz for us. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. ABC News has just learned President Biden is considering major new action, significant restrictions on the southern border. ABC's Mary Bruce is at the White House now with the details. Mary, what can you tell us? Well, Lindsay, I'm told that the White House is considering possibly taking executive action to impose tough new restrictions on asylum. One possibility would be to bar migrants from seeking asylum if they cross between U.S. ports of entry. Now, I'm told the president is looking at a wide range of options. This is just one possibility that's under consideration and that no final decisions have yet been made. But this does, of course, come after Republicans on the Hill under pressure from Donald Trump tanked that bipartisan border deal. And as President Biden is eager to show voters that he takes this issue seriously. Lindsay? Mary Bruce from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. We're getting a first look at the former FBI informant who authorities say admitted to having ties with Russian intelligence. He's now charged with lying about President Biden's son, the president, and Ukraine. Meanwhile, Republicans question the president's brother behind closed doors. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has more. Tonight, a first glimpse of the longtime FBI informant accused of working with Russian intelligence officials to spread lies about President Biden. Alexander Smirnov doing his best to conceal his identity as he spirited away from a courthouse in Las Vegas. Prosecutors say Smirnov was actively peddling new lies that could impact U.S. elections after meeting with Russian intelligence officials in November. Smirnov is charged with lying to the FBI, making up a story that as vice president, Joe Biden accepted a $5 million bribe from Burisma, the Ukrainian energy company where his son Hunter sat on the board. That false story cited by House Republicans again and again to justify launching their impeachment investigation. A highly credible FBI source alleges that Joe Biden received $5 million in exchange for pressuring for the firing of a Ukrainian prosecutor. According to this highly credible well-respected human source, yeah. then uh, there was a bribe made. But prosecutors say it was all a fabrication. Today, Congressman Jim Jordan, a leader of the impeachment investigation, deflecting, insisting he had been once told by a Justice Department official that Spirinoff was credible. That this, this confidential human source had all the indicia of credibility because he checked out the times and places that he said he was and found that he was actually in those locations. But so, they're now calling so him a liar, the well, special counsel. All I'm saying is you got to ask the FBI about that. He, he, he may, in fact, have given false statement. I don't know. Democrats say the Smirnoff indictment makes impeachment case closed. Well, I think the Smirnoff revelations destroy the entire case. It was that foundation that the whole House of Cards has been built on, and the entire thing has collapsed. But Republicans who have uncovered no evidence President Biden committed impeachable offenses pressing anyway. Today calling the president's brother James Biden to testify. No comment outside, but behind closed doors, James Biden telling lawmakers his brother has never had any involvement or any direct or indirect financial interest in his business dealings. Biden adding, I never asked my brother to take any official action on behalf of me, my business associates, or anyone else.
Our thanks to Pierre for that. Overseas now, Ukraine's military is warning that Russia is about to launch a major offensive with U.S. aid to Ukraine blocked by Republicans in the House. ABC's James Longman is in Ukraine for us. Tonight, Ukrainian commanders with a stark warning. Russia is on the brink of a major offensive on multiple fronts across the east. Bombing Kramatorsk overnight following their takeover of the town of Adivka, regaining ground lost in Ukraine's counteroffensive last summer. Russian President Vladimir Putin with his top general surveying the territory won back, congratulating the troops and urging them on. Almost two years into this war, Ukraine says it's outmanned and outgunned. Digging trenches as the Russians close in, military aid on hold, blocked by Republicans in the U.S. House. And with new U.S. sanctions looming after the death of Putin's fiercest critic Alexei Navalny, Russian authorities have now detained a dual U.S.-Russian citizen. They released this video, reportedly showing 33-year-old ballerina Kesnia Karolina, who lives and works in Los Angeles, with a hat covering her eyes and handcuffed, ready to appear in court. She's been charged with treason. Russian authorities claim she donated about $50 to a Ukrainian charity in the United States. Karolina was part of the Baltimore Ballet in 2017, her former mother-in-law says she was arrested while visiting family in Russia. If we don't help her, we can say goodbye to her. If we do not protect her as an American citizen, nobody else will. Our thanks to James for that. In Gaza, a new hit in the deepening humanitarian crisis. The number of aid trucks entering the war-torn Gaza Strip has now decreased over the past few weeks, with the delivery of food and aid to the north almost completely stopped. That's according to the United Nations and the Israeli government. Our Marcus Moore has the latest. Tonight, deepening desperation inside Gaza as the World Food Program pauses vital food deliveries to the north after hungry crowds rushed aid trucks. Their decision follows what they call, quote, complete chaos and violence due to the collapse of civil order when several trucks were looted and a driver was beaten. It's a testimony to, to how desperate people are that they were literally running into machine gun fire to collect a box of food or a bag of wheat flour. That's the level of, desper of desperation. For weeks, northern Gaza has been nearly cut off from aid. One UN organization saying it hasn't been able to deliver food there for nearly a month. Hundreds of trucks sit idle at the border. <laughs> UNICEF now saying almost 16% of all children under two in northern Gaza are acutely malnourished, as the UN warns all of Gaza is on the brink of famine. The amount of aid delivered since the start of the war dropping 80%. Many seen struggling to find clean water, others carrying the only food they can get their hands on, sacks of flour from a distribution center, and children lining up for a meal holding empty plates. <laughs> this man says we're dying of hunger. Either stop the war or bury us in one hole. It comes as heavy fighting continues in Gaza. And just today, new hope for the remaining hostages. A member of Israel's cabinet says there are signs of a possible deal with Hamas. So much desperation there are. Thanks to Marcus for that. It was a tragic day at a Florida beach for a family on vacation from Indiana. Their two children playing in a deep sand hole when the walls collapsed and trapped them inside. Their nine-year-old son was rescued, but their seven-year-old daughter did not survive. Victor Akendo was on the scene. Tonight, a family vacation turning tragic on a Florida beach after a little girl became trapped in a five to six foot sand hole. There is a little girl buried under the sand and they have not gotten to her yet. A frantic race to reach seven-year-old Sloan Mattingly after sand collapsed on her and nine-year-old brother Maddox while they were digging a hole on the beach in Lauderdale by the sea. Panicked witnesses calling 911. The father started yelling for help. Uh -huh. His child is caught in a hole in the sand. My husband's up there and a bunch of men are digging on the beach. The boy, who was buried up to his chest, was rescued, but officials say his sister was trapped beneath him. Witnesses say it took about 15 minutes to reach Sloan, who was rushed to the hospital and later died. The parents were helpless. I mean, they, they couldn't find their child. Everybody was trying to help. Collapsing sand holes have claimed dozens of lives over the years. Some communities ban beachgoers from digging them. Beach. What makes it so dangerous? Uh, the, the fact that sand is unstable and it can move very quickly. And it could just collapse at any it time. It could collapse, yes. Seven-year-old Sloan's family was on vacation here in Lauderdale by the sea from Indiana. Her elementary school calling her a bright, sweet, loving, 
first grade student. Lindsay? Just a horrific story, Victor. Thank you. Now to the race for the White House. Our Eva Pilgrim asks Nikki Haley about Donald Trump's comments regarding her husband's deployment overseas, and Haley fires back. Rachel Scott has this report. Tonight, just three days before the South Carolina primary, former Governor Nikki Haley firing back at Donald Trump for mocking her husband, Michael, who is serving a one-year deployment overseas as a major in the South Carolina Army National Guard. Where's her husband? Oh, he's away. He's away. Where, what happened to her husband? What happened to her husband? On the trail, Haley growing emotional, talking about her husband's deployment. I wish our children and I could see him tonight, but we can't. Haley today addressing Trump's comments in an interview with ABC's Eva Pilgrim and defending military families like her own. I'm in that year-long prayer wanting him to come home safely, but so many military families go through this. He just doesn't get it, that this is about something bigger than ourselves. We saw you sort of fight back against him when he mentioned your husband and his deployment. That really ticked you off. <laughs> I mean, look, I, it's, it's not personal for me and Michael. We can handle that. It's personal when you think of military families. They go through a lot. Don't make light of that. To me, veterans are off limits. Don't talk about them. Don't say anything because every freedom Donald Trump has is because of the men and women in our military. He's never known what it means to sacrifice for something other than yourself. Haley with this message to South Carolina Republicans who would vote for Trump. Don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't get this right in a primary because we will lose. It's that simple, we will lose. Everything he touches, we lose. And so at some point you have to say maybe he's the problem. Our thanks to Eva and Rachel for that. More than two years after a actor Alec Baldwin fatally shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the New Mexico set of their movie Rust, the film's weapons handler is set to go on trial. Armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was charged with two counts of involuntary manslaughter and an additional charge of tampering with evidence in connection to Hutchins' death and injury to director Joel Souza. Gutierrez-Reed has pleaded not guilty to all charges. Jury selection began today after a judge denied the defense's latest effort to dismiss those charges. Tonight, heavy fog is being blamed for a massive pileup in Jones County, Mississippi. Roughly 20 cars and trucks slamming into each other on Highway 84. Ten people had to be rushed to the hospital. Meantime, heavy rain and snow is expected from Illinois to upstate New York tomorrow. And we still have much more to get to tonight coming up. How much do you love Costco? One couple visited more than 250 stores, even wrote a book about it. We talked to the authors of The Joy of Costco. But Next, a missile strike hits a residential building in Damascus, who Syria says is to blame. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from Hartsfield-Jackson Airport in Atlanta, I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Hundreds of protesters took to London streets, arguing that WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange should be freed on the grounds of free speech. Assange today fought extradition to the United States in a final hearing in London, where he's been held in prison for five years. Assange admits to releasing troves of confidential U.S. military records and diplomatic cables. Syria blamed Israel for a precision strike this morning on a residential building in Damascus. Missiles killed at least two people. Israel has been accused of targeting Iranian Revolutionary Guard stationed in Syria more than a half dozen times, citing their support for Hamas and Hamas's October 7th terror attack. A Japanese gang leader has been charged in Manhattan with attempting to traffic uranium and weapons grade uh, plutonium from Burma and other countries. Prosecutors allege the gang leader told an undercover agent he hoped to get the materials to Iran to help them develop nuclear weapons. We all love quality products, but we love them even more for a big bargain. Our next guests are Costco's biggest super fans. They love it so much, in fact, the couple visited more than 250 Costco's in 47 states and more than a dozen countries. After David and Susan Schwartz's adventure, they immortalized their love for the retail giant in a book. The Joy of Costco, a treasure hunt from A to Z, dives into the Costco experience by answering questions on how it all started, its domestic and global operations, and so much more and we are excited to welcome David and Susan to the show tonight. Thank you all so much for joining us. Oh, thank thank you. you for having us. Congratulations on the book. I noticed Thanks. right away this was dedicated to both of your parents. And so is that where you initially got the love for, for oh, Costco? Absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, both of our parents loved Costco. So and that's how we were introduced. So we knew about Costco and loved Costco before we met each other. What is it about Costco, this giant warehouse? You know, it's it's it's, first of all, it's the quality of the products, very carefully uh, curated and very carefully selected. Of course, it's the price, too, which is very, very low. But there's another thing which we absolutely love. But you never know what you're going to find there because they rotate stuff in and out all the time. So when you go there, you know, you keep your eye out for, for stuff that you didn't anticipate finding. And it's a treasure hunt, which is why we called it. Uh, a treasure hunt from A to Z. And, and Susan, I'm so curious when you go from Costco to Costco, because I feel like I've only been to a handful in my life, is there a big difference yes. when you go from one to the other? Absolutely. About 40% of the product is different mm. regionally as you go around the world. And we've been to 14 different countries, including the U.S. And the food court is where you see a really big difference. So different items in the food court. They'll always have the hot dog and the beverage. They'll always have pizza and a bulgogi or a chicken bake kind of thing. But the rest of it's all different. So you can get, you know, fried chicken in South Korea, you can get um, in the deli section, not the food court, you can get reindeer sausage in Alaska. It's different. And I like to say it's local and it's global. And I want to make the distinction to our viewers you all were not sponsored by yes. Costco to do this. No, totally we, independent. No. We do not work for Costco. We've never worked there. If the book doesn't work out, we might get jobs there. Uh. But, no. <laughs> but we, um, it took us two years to meet the, the, head, the top people, and it took another three years to convince them we were writing the book whether they liked it or not. They're pretty modest. They were not thrilled. I don't think they thought we were stalking them, but we were really passionate. It, and it all worked out in the end. So you were mentioning some of the foods that you can try there. A lot of people know when they go to Costco, they can test different foods. How does that strategy work? Is it effective with when it comes to profitability for them? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I think so. I think, you know, the the it's a great opportunity for people to taste stuff that they haven't tasted before. And, you know, we, we've, we've bought stuff 
on the basis of the tasting. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of other people do. You know, they're very careful and very smart about their business. The basic pr uh, premise is 3,800 items, highly curated. Your local supermarket's got 40,000, Walmart's got 140,000, and nothing's marked up more than 12 to 14%. So they make their money basically off the membership fee. I didn't realize that Costco is actually the third largest retailer in the world. Yeah. Was there anything in particular that surprised you all as you were doing this deep dive into Costco? Well, I was very surprised at how popular Costco is in the Far East. Mm. Yeah. You know, people had said to me, you know, Costco won't succeed in the Far East. You know, the apartments are small. They, they can't buy in bulk. And the fact is they figure out how to use Costco. And when we got to South Korea and Japan and Taiwan, it's unbelievable, and, and the mainland of China, it's unbelievable how popular Costco is. Any other tips that you might give people? Because I had no idea until just now that you can even buy hearing aids in Costco. Any other th unexpected items that people might look for there? Well, caskets and coffins, obviously. Because um, <laughs> they sell them at Costco. Yes, they do. Yeah, they're in the you box. have to get them online. But yes, they do. And they're, they're very well priced. Yes. <laughs> David and Susan, I love your enthusiasm. It is contagious. I, I feel like, you know, I'm not even a Costco person, but I, I feel like I want to go to Costco now. So Great. thank you so much for coming on the show. One thank let you. our viewers know their book, The Joy of Costco, A Treasure Hunt from A to Z, is out wherever books are sold. And still to come, getting the ceremony of their dreams as a show of gratitude, why these brides-to-be were given a major wedding gift. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For non-stop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Finally tonight, brides-to-be in Camden County, New Jersey, received their something new in the form of a free wedding dress. It was a thank you to local veterans for their service. And our Philadelphia partner station, WPVI, brings us this heartwarming story in our local lowdown. Her smile says it all. We're here today honoring those who have served and family members of those who have served by offering wedding dresses for brides-to-be. She looks gorgeous. There's no cost for any of the women that are here today shopping. We know that we're helping these women out financially, and we also know that we're embracing them to create a memory for them. I hope you find the dress of your, uh, your dreams here. My involvement uh, as a commissioner started many years ago when my son Jeremy was killed in Afghanistan. And so as a Gold Star mother, I've been involved in local government. In Camden County, we do our best to recognize those who have served and provide support and services for them. Often forgotten are the women that have served in the military, and this is our way of just acknowledging their service and sacrifice and being able to give back to them in a small way, but I know will mean a lot to them. This is so beautiful. My name is Amala. I just retired from the military in 2020. This experience has been amazing. This one is a definite contender because it's it's hard being in the military and especially hard being a veteran. By them offering this kind of gift to us, it means the world. You know, every little bit helps. So this one too. Okay. Well, they are all brand new dresses. They're, they're beautiful. They were donated to the county a few years back. Simply amazing. And for those that have served, they may not have the finances to truly have the wedding of their dreams. And we're hoping to be able to provide that for them. You are beautiful. 
What a nice gift. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The Moose started just number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane, celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News. Live. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to District Court. For the past four years, I've chosen to follow counsel and guidance that has led me into a dark delusion. Ruby Frankie, the Mormon momfluencer whose controversial tough love videos hit a dark reality, was back in court today, giving a tearful statement during her sentencing hearing. I was so disoriented that I believed dark was light and right was wrong. Her estranged husband, Kevin, and two oldest children sitting in the front row behind prosecutors as she apologized to them directly. Kevin, my husband of more than 23 years, you are the love of my life. I'm so sorry to leave to you to finish what we both started together. To my babies, my six little chicks, you are part of me. I can see now that over the past four years, I was in a deep undercurrent that led us to danger. After pleading guilty to four counts of child abuse back in December, Frankie was sentenced to four consecutive prison terms ranging from one to 15 years. We're not going to find out what that jail time is anytime soon because it's not the judge who decides the length of a sentence in Utah. Instead, it's the Utah Board of Pardons and Parole that will evaluate the case to determine how long uh, they'll end up spending in prison. Frankie's former business partner and therapist Jody Hildebrandt was also sentenced to the same consecutive prison terms. She was brief in her statement to the court. I sincerely love these children. 
I desire for them to heal physically and emotionally. Throughout the hearing, the prosecution detailing at length the abuse that occurred inside Jody's Utah home. In addition to physical abuse, the children were emotionally abused to the extent that each believed to some degree that they deserved what was being done to them. Had the older of the children not had the courage to run away and ask a neighbor to call the police, heaven only knows how much longer he could have survived in that situation. That call to police came in August of 2023. Nine, I'm on the address of your emergency. I just had a 12-year-old boy. 